He's wanted for crimes against humanity, but the son of Libya's former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam, has been released from prison. So what will this mean for Libya as it struggles with violence and competing governments? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darin Abu Gaida. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi has been freed under a new amnesty law. His release was approved by one of Libya's administrations based in the eastern city of Tobruk. A court in Tripoli had sentenced him to death in 2015 for war crimes and suppression of demonstrations during the 2011 uprising. Well, the son of Libya's former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam, is also wanted by the International Criminal Court. Analysts say his release could further complicate the already fragile situation in the country. So Libya has been deeply divided since its longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi was deposed and killed six years ago. In July 2012, the country held its first free elections in more than four decades. The transitional government handed power to the General National Congress based in Tripoli. More elections followed, and the internationally recognized House of Representatives was formed in 2014, but the GNC refused to step aside. And later that year, the House of Representatives was forced to sit in the eastern city of Tobruk. The renegade general, Khalif al-Haftar, took charge of a growing army which eventually allied itself with the Tobruk government. And there were peace talks in Geneva and Morocco, and in January 2015, the two factions agreed a deal, but it was never implemented. Then, late last year, the GNA, the Government of National Accord, brokered by the UN, was set up. And in March of this year, General Haftar was named head of Libya's army, provided he recognized the GNA. Lots to discuss with our guests. Joining us here in Doha, we have Noha Abul Dahab. She's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. In Tripoli, Fathi Fadli, who's a writer and professor at the University of Tripoli, also in Doha, Ibrahim Freyhat, he's a conflict resolution professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and also the author of Unfinished Revolutions, Yemen, Libya and Tunisia after the Arab Spring. Welcome to you all. Noha, on the face of it, officially we are hearing that Saif al-Islam Gaddafi was freed because of this amnesty law. But what could be happening behind the scenes? Could this brigade that freed him have gotten anything in return and why would they free him now? Well, um, uh, you're absolutely right to point out that, uh, you know, it, it, his release, if he has indeed been released, um, what's telling is the brigade's statement, the Abu Bakr Siddi uh, brigade statement yesterday, uh, referred to the release of political prisoners in the spirit of this amnesty law that was issued by the Tobruk government um, in 2015. And so it seems to me that, the, that there are indications uh, that there is some sort of a political agreement between the Tobruk government and the uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Brigade has been taking place. Uh, Fatih, what are you hearing about uh, Saif al-Islam's relief? And is it surprising that he's been freed or the fact that he's been freed uh, under this amnesty by the Tobruk House of Representatives? Uh, actually, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, amnesty uh, law, which is released by Tobruk uh, Parliament, uh, is not uh, actually should be a low one. We, we, we wish, we, we wanted uh, Saif al-Islam or any accused uh, person, a Libyan person, to be released or not released based on a court decisions, not based on a political uh, game or a political interest. And that's uh, actually his release uh, or not releasing uh, based on a political uh, game will uh, increase and will add more uh, problems to the uh, country. It, he is an opponent. He is wanna be still wanna be in in a bar. There are already enough conflict and confrontations in Libya in all the sides, economic, political, and military confrontations. And the releasing of Saif al Islam will add more uh, to this conflict. We'll talk uh, about the implications again, of his release in a in moment, but since you're speaking to us from Tripoli, let me ask you for just a moment. Uh, at the time of his capture, there were scenes of jubilation, people very happy that he was captured. I doubt very much that you are seeing the se same scenes right now in the country. Yeah, he, uh, since, since his arrest until today, uh, 
there are uh, many changes in the country, many changes actually. There are the confrontation, the, the, the revolution against uh, February the 17th revolution, and all the problems the Libyan citizen went through since his arrest. It changed a lot of uh, vision uh, about the Libyan uh, people. His release will be make some people happy, but will make other uh, other people are very angry at uh, the news of his uh, release. Okay, let's uh, ask Ibrahim Freyhat on the reaction specifically, again, Ibrahim. When you look at uh, the issue of the UN-backed government, what do we expect the reaction there to be? Well, I think this is going to be uh, very surprising for them. Uh, and the main reason for this is that actually this is the release is coming as a result of uh, some sort of a political agreement uh, that uh, has seems to be uh, uh, forged between the, Gover the House of Representatives uh, in Tobruk and uh, with the Zintan Brigade or Abu Bakr Sadiq Brigade that uh, they were holding al Qaddafi. Now, let's keep in mind that uh, Zintani Brigade, who uh, have been holding uh, Saif al-Islam uh, since 2011, they were in close alliance with, uh, with Haftar and the House of Representatives in, the, in Tobruk. Uh, so this should be understood as a result of this kind of polarization within Libya. Uh, and that's why the uh, UN-backed government in uh, Tripoli uh, uh, should not, will, is not expected or unlikely to take this very softly because this is going to further complicate the, uh, uh, you know, the, the already complicated uh, political map in uh, Libya and is going to further uh, polarize uh, the political equation in Libya even more. But when you so, talk about a political agreement, what exactly do you mean here? What are you referring to and what kind of agreement could have been worked on? Well, that's, that's the issue that uh, yet to be uh, seen, actually. What is exactly uh, led to this release, uh, this unexpected release, actually, at this particular moment? Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, let's keep in mind that uh, holding him by uh, certain brigades was not the right situation in the first place. You know, for someone on his level accused of war crimes so should be held by the state, not by brigades. Uh, that's one. Two is that to be released uh, without any, uh, without uh, through the court, uh, and especially that the ICC is demanding uh, the extradition of Saif al, uh, Saif al Islam. So there is some politics, uh, fr uh, uh, some politics have been involved from the beginning and now. So I think the best way to, uh, to think about this is that as a result of the, uh, the polarization between the East and the West, and now uh, we have seen lately actually uh, some uh, escalation in the tension between uh, between the East and the West, between uh, the House of Representatives and the West and the UN back government. So I think the best reading I can read of this is that uh, uh, that there is uh, help needed or appealing uh, to the uh, groups uh, of uh, former uh, Qaddafi uh, uh, and uh, president of uh, Libya. So this uh, release of Saif al-Islam, I think it's more of appealing to that group or to the people that he represents right. and could join uh, the political uh, conflict between the East and the West. Here's the thing, Noha. We were, uh, Ibrahim was mentioning the ICC just a moment ago. So this is really a direct challenge to the ICC and the UN who are demanding Saif al-Islam's extradition on uh, uh, that he should stand trial on war crimes at the International Criminal Court. The Hague. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, uh, his arrest warrant from the ICC has been lingering since 2011. Um, and I'm sure we will be seeing some statements coming out of the ICC, perhaps the UN, uh, condemning his release and requesting again his transfer uh, uh, to The Hague. However, I mean, the, the, the problem remains how will he be arrested? How, how he, will he be transferred to The Hague? Uh, and so the ICC remains in, still in a very sort of tenuous position with regards to his release, if indeed he has been released. Um, one thing I wanted to add uh, following Ibrahim's uh, uh, intervention there is that despite the fact that this amnesty law has been invoked in the statements that we've seen thus far since uh, over, the, over the last couple of days. Um, the, the, the amnesty law, it's law number five, I believe, of 2015, or law number six. It, uh, it states that, you know, um, uh, 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 
individuals should be released, but there are certain conditions that prevent their release, such as if they were uh, accused of crimes of rape, torture, corruption. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that in the trial of Sif al-Islam Qaddafi that took place in 2014, and the 30 plus other individuals from the former regime, uh, corruption was one of the charges. And, uh, uh, and, and many of the crimes that were listed in the conditions of the amnesty law were also included in the charges. So it's interesting that they're invoking this law when it doesn't actually apply. Right. Um, Fatih, the lawyer, Saif al-Islam's lawyer, has been speaking to media, and what he said is that he expects Gaddafi to address the Libyan people and saying that he wanted to work on reconciliation and fighting terrorism in Libya. Do you see at all a role in Saif al-Islam, uh, Gaddafi, going forward in the country? Uh, actually, if, if this has happened, it's, it's just like a joke. It's a pathetic, yani. Uh, Saif al-Islam, his father, and his, the regime of his father got a chance for 42 years, 42 years, a chance to govern a country and end up as a failure, a failing uh, state, a failure state. And I, I really surprised if he still wants to come uh, again and play any political role in the country after all this failure. Uh, a huge wealth, uh, revenue, oil revenue, uh, power, uh, time, again, 42 years, and yet they come out with a uh, failing uh, state. And I think if he tried again, I didn't understand what new ideas, what new efforts he can bring uh, to the country. Uh, plus, his father's regime, oh, which is safe, was part of it, is a terrorist state, actually. It's a brutal state. I mean, uh, the revolution actually happens because of the brutality, because of the terrorism. He acted and he brags against the Libyan people. I'm really surprised. And uh, uh, if he can But here's do the anything, thing, Fatli, he when you court, have a country like Libya that has actually, suffered through the past six years, it has weakened institutions, it has three different governments who are vying for power. So this uh, just makes it much easier for men like uh, Saif al Islam Gaddafi to uh, just come in and fill the vacuum. You have a real power vacuum going on in the country. I agree with you. We have a huge problems confrontation uh, since uh, six years ago. That's uh, true. But to fix these problems, does not to bring the people who are causing it. I mean, say that Islam is one of the reasons of what we are going through now, directly or indirectly. I mean, the, we are suffering the result, the fruit of uh, the regime, of the previous uh, regime. I okay. mean, he is an element of adding, uh, of causing the confrontation. Ibrahim mm -hmm. Afraihat. Mm -hmm. Actually, he yeah. cannot. He should not, actually. He should not. And Ibrahim mm -hmm. Afraihat, there are several local news reports, at least, coming out of Libya that say that Saif al-Islam might be heading to the city of Baida, perhaps. These are not confirmed whatsoever. But Baida is where the eastern government is based. We know that the eastern government is allied, is backed, rather, by General Khalifa al-Haftar. We were mentioning just a moment ago, uh, Khalifa al-Haftar being a close ally of Egypt as well as the United Arab Emirates. So let's look at the big picture here for a second and look at the role that countries are playing in Libya. So when you take the UAE specifically, what is their policy in Libya? Well, uh, here's the thing. Uh, uh, I, I think, I mean, we are seeing all types of principles have been violated in the name of fighting terrorism. Uh, and I think this is one, just one additional uh, thing that we're seeing more under the name of fighting terrorism. We're seeing when the you talk about principles terrorism. being violated, am I safe to assume that you are talking about the UN report that's been put out? Well, it's about, yes, it's about the UN report. It's about, uh, I mean, the war crimes in Syria and, and everywhere and in the region. And just for clarification, that UN report uh, basically revealed that the UAE, this is according to the UN, the UAE had violated the UN arms embargo on Libya by providing air power for the forces of Khalifa al-Haftar in eastern Libya, just for uh, clarification. But go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Saif al-Islam was held by Zintani Group. Zintani Group, traditionally, I mean, since all this uh, civil war started, have been uh, close allies of Haftar. And Haftar is not a secret, has been uh, strongly supported from day one uh, by the United Arab Emirates and by Egypt. Uh, so we're seeing this, actually, the reports that he's going to the east uh, towards Haftar. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that uh, this in all coordination with, uh, with Haftar and his uh, strong allies, uh, Zintan, in, uh, uh, in the west. Uh, so uh, uh, that's one additional report that we're seeing from the UN about uh, violation of uh, UN Security Council resolution. 
1970 that uh, enforces embargo on Libya uh, in terms of arms uh, supplies. Uh, so uh, under this name of fighting terrorism, and we're seeing in, in the intervention, uh, the Egyptian intervention in Libya lately also uh, of bombing after the terrorist attack that happened in, in Egypt. Uh, so uh, a number of uh, attacks by, by the Egyptian government. So under this name of uh, fighting tourism, actually we're seeing the rules are changing. Everything is changing in the region. And this is one additional thing. Uh, and I think this is going just to add, uh, to make the situation in Libya uh, more disastrous uh, in terms of adding new players uh, of the former regime elements joining, the, uh, joining this. And talking about reconciliation, Qaddafi uh, and Saif al-Islam actually failed to do reconciliation in 2007 and 2008 before the Arab Spring began. Right. So not sure what role for reconciliation that Saif al-Islam has, but I think it's going to be all under this uh, slogan that we have in uh, fighting tourism and where situations continue to be d deteriorating. Uh, Noha, I see you nodding along to what Ibrahim is saying. Do you think that the dynamics of the Libyan conflict are just going to continue to fluctuate depending on uh, the regional and international players? And uh, we spoke a little bit about the UAE. Uh, what about Egypt's yeah. role? Egypt's been vying for a role at that table. Right. I mean, well, you can see the beginnings of this narrative uh, that Ibrahim has, has referred to, the counterterrorism narrative sort of coming into play in Libya right now. And what more opportunities in time right now with the, with the current Gulf, Gulf diplomatic crisis as well. Um, and so, and so the, what was telling is in one of the Libyan Arabic uh, media reports, um, uh, allegedly a Zintani militia man had stated that the release of, of Saif al-Islam Qaddafi is uh, important for the unification of Libya. So if indeed you know, this was said, then you can see if there is sort of this uh, rapprochement between Haftar and uh, the, the brigade, the Abu Bakr Siddiq brigade for the release of Saif al-Islam, it would be in the name of counterterrorism, in the name of unifying Libya, in the name of national security. And Haftar and, and company, bolstered by sort of their alliance with Egypt and the UAE, especially now with, with the diplomatic rift happening in, in the Gulf region, uh, it's, it, it makes sense in terms of timing. What is Egypt's long-term policy, though, in Libya? Well, I mean, their 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 goals are, um, you know, they're, they're anti sort of their counterterrorism goals, their alleged counterterrorism goals, their anti-Islamist sort of um, uh, 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 slant. Haftar fits that sort of profile, but it's not just that. It's also, um, you know, since we're talking about bigger picture, picture, it's this renewed authoritarianism. It's this bolstered authoritarianism post Arab Spring that's happening, and so Haftar is sort of coming from that from that background in the sense that. Sure, he was, he was Gaddafi's strongman in the late 60s, uh, throughout the 70s and the 80s. Sure, he was then e uh, exiled. However, he comes from that sort of um, uh, ideology, this sort of, um, you know, from an authoritarian sort of ideology. And so you can see this alliance using that, using the narrative of counterterrorism and anti-Islamism, um, Egypt and Haftar sort of siding that way, and then bringing in Sif al-Aslami would, would, would further empower that. Uh, Fatha, we were, Ibrahim just a moment ago, in fact, was talking about national reconciliation. Do you believe that national reconciliation is a viable option in the short-term future in Libya? And what would it take uh, to get there? Yeah, it is possible. Uh, national reconciliation is possible. Uh, regarding that, no uh, uh, foreign countries involved, no foreign parties involved in this, because uh, our the major problems that we are going through is because of intervention of other countries and institutions and uh, personnel and politicians. Uh, this is the main uh, reason for the conflict, like uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, Egypt is uh, smuggling uh, weapons to one of the parties to Hefter to so the people killing each other and Libyan people killing each other and the problem continue. How can, for example, uh, United Arab Emirates and Egypt participate in reconciliation? How can Saif al-Islam and other people like him or Hefter, who are the reason of the problems, can be a part of reconciliation? Yes, the national reconciliation is possible, and but has to be done internally, has to be done by uh, uh, out of the people who are causing the problem and away from the people who are interfering in, in, in our country. It should be a national thing. It's a national reconciliation that taking out the people who are causing uh, the problems. Uh, Ibrahim Freyhat, the, the fact of the matter is that though 
Libya does suffer from a quote-unquote terrorist problem. ISIL is a real issue in the country, with even warnings from American officials, uh, counterterrorism officials, uh, calling uh, Libya, in fact, a powder keg, saying that ISIL is regrouping and it's exploiting the chaos and political uh, vacuum. So it's a very difficult situation for the country uh, to be in. That's correct. Uh, and we should actually ask ourselves uh, what, who, produced, who produced who. I mean, the chaos in Libya produced ISIS. It's not the other way around. I mean, the chaos in Libya started right after the collapse of the, I mean, from the first, from the revolution and then followed by uh, the, after the collapse of the Gaddafi regime. And that's when, uh, uh, quite for some time, and then we start, we had the civil war started in, uh, with, the, with the emergence of Haftar in the, uh, uh, in the East. Uh, who uh, uh, wanted to, uh, according to him, to eliminate all Islamists from, from Libya, which is a very unrealistic goal because uh, how you're going to do this. And the, the only outcome was of the emergence of Haftar actually it was to further polarization of the Libyans and the failure of any political settlements. And as a result, we started to see the emergence of ISIS uh, there. So if we actually want to really address the issue of, uh, of ISIS in Libya, we should be looking at the causes, the underlying causes that produced ISIS, which is the absence of a political settlement, the failure of a reconstruction, an effective reconstruction process, and actually uh, practices such as this. A war crime, uh, someone who's accused of war crimes in Libya is being released without going through the court, without being uh, properly treated and, uh, you know, dealt with on the ground that he's accused of war crimes, whether it's through the ICC or an effective judiciary uh, within, Li within Libya. So to release him, a war, a war, uh, uh, war criminal, to release him uh, with no accountability, you're sending a message in Libya that no matter how many uh, war crimes you commit in Libya, you will eventually be released with some sort of a political agreement or a political deal that's done between the parties, which is going to exacerbate the crisis and, exa and make Libya less safer and more chaotic and also encourage others with the absence of this principle of accountability right. is to be engaged with these practices and then we wonder why we have ISIS. I suppose, Actually, Noha, you agree with, with uh, what Ibrahim Freyhat has to say in terms of no accountability, but also give me your thoughts, final thoughts, in fact, on uh, where you think national reconciliation stands and what are the scenarios going forward? Well, I mean, as as we've said before, the the ICC uh, sort of avenue is 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 unlikely to to happen anytime soon, um, and I agree with uh, with Mr. Fethi that uh, you know it needs to be a very sort of a national a national process, a national reconciliation, obviously, um, and so um, uh, now that's much easier said than done, given the rival governments and and, and so on. I think there needs to be um, the the. The fallacy of the counterterrorism narrative for the sake of security and national unification needs to be exposed. Um, it needs to be um, uh, made clear that uh, the priorities of the victims and of the, of, the of your average Libyan uh, need, need, to, need to come first. All right. We'll leave it there. We thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all my guests. Uh, Noha Abul Dahab, Fathi Fadli and Ibrahim Fraihat, thank you for joining us and thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For myself and the whole team here in Doha, goodbye for now.